Hi, I'm Barbara from Vienna, Austria, and I've been creating junk journals for over five years. Throughout my journey, I've accumulated lots of craft supplies, and today I'm excited to share with you the essentials I reach for time and time again when creating or decorating junk journals or planners. These are in no particular order. So let's start off with a big one, a sewing machine. It doesn't have to be this sewing machine, obviously. Any sewing machine will do. I cannot imagine crafting junk journals without my sewing machine because it just adds such interesting texture. This one here is called Super Jeans Toyota. I bought it from Amazon. You can get smaller models, cheaper models, secondhand models. And mine, for example, only has some basic stitches. It's not a fancy machine at all, but it is definitely one of my favorite and essential tools. Let me share some examples in my chunkiest junk journal. I have a flip through of this available and I will link it down below for you. As extra texture element in your collages or clusters by adding machine stitching to pieces of paper. Here a zigzag stitch on a belly band. Again, as a decorative element as part of a little collage. Stitching on pockets. Even though this is not stitched onto my page, you get the illusion that it is. Here you see I've decorated a tuck spot with a snippet roll, which I have sewn on top of. So I have these snippet rolls on wooden sticks because they're also beautiful decorative elements in your craft room. I keep them secured with a paper clip and I have these ready to go. I will also link a video below where we make these painted sticks for storage together. Here's one which is a bit wider. So I sewed two lines of zigzag stitches and these are just attached onto some wide masking tape. And of course you can also add some machine stitching to some fabric snippet rolls. This is all I have left unfortunately, but you see the wavy stitching on top. So you can see this in the video where I show you these sticks. Here again we have some stitching as decorative elements on this house I've made. And she can fly out by the way, she's attached with a magnet so that she'll stay in there. <laughs> again as decorative elements, once in a very light color around this tag and then once here in a messy zigzag way to symbolize the earth that these flowers are planted in. And here's an example of some very messy stitching here on this dried leaf. And again here on this autumnal card where I framed a photo that I took from a walk. I have tried a variety of paper trimmers in the past and this is the one that once I got it I could not live without in my craft world. <laughs> This one is by Tonic Studio. It doesn't have to be this brand, but a small guillotine trimmer, which is light. So it's easy to maneuver around your craft desk and small enough to have a space on or near your craft desk is super valuable. So when I make ephemera, I can just easily grab it and cut it right here on my craft desk. Let me share the measurements of this. So the length is 11 and a quarter inches or 28 and a half centimeters. And the width is about the six and a quarter inches or 15.8 centimeters. Coffee or tea dyed papers. I use regular copy paper. I usually coffee dye my papers. Here's the difference between coffee dyeing and tea dyeing. This one is coffee, this one is tea. But I usually like to have some sort of interest on my coffee dyed papers, even though I might end up covering some or most of it up. 
here are just some examples these are coffee dyed with dyes we have some fun splattering on these on these i've used a technique with adding some ink and on these i've added some ground coffee and some stenciling and on these i've used some rusty items i will link a playlist for you below with various methods that i use for coffee dyeing to get interesting results like these next is my tearing ruler i have one here by joy crafts it is a metal tearing ruler i only ever use this small deckled edge here i have not been able to find these online anymore but there are other brands that make tearing rulers even though the metal edge is great for tearing if I would buy one today, I would take one where I can see through because a lot of times I don't see if I'm tearing straight or not. For example, if I put this on the edge of my book page, I don't really know when it's straight. Sure, I can go by the lines here on my craft mat, but if I don't have that, I'm never going to know when it's straight. But I do love the torn edge look that it gives. So here are again a few examples. I used it on these wallpaper strips for this collage. Usually I'm not able to tear as controlled as I would like. So having a tearing ruler is just great. And I use it for so many different things. Here you see it on this vintage wallpaper here as well. For me, this looks so much more interesting than a straight cut edge. And I've also done it on these two tags here. Sometimes it's nice to have the mixture of straight edges and torn edges, like in this collage, for example. This centerpiece here has cut edges, but these pieces here have torn edges. I think it just gives you a little bit more interest. Next is my beloved Crocodile. Mine happens to be from We Are Memory Keepers. Again, there are other brands out there. This is definitely a more pricey item, but one that you will have for the rest of your crafting life. Obviously, there are other hole punchers like this or like this that I also use from time to time. These are two different sizes. This one has quite a small hole. This one has a big hole, which is great if you want to add a hole reinforcement because this hole seems to have the same size as the inside of the standard hole reinforcements. But the advantage of this one is, first of all, that it is much easier to punch through thicker materials. So especially if you have issues using the strength of your hand, you're really going to love this because this is like going through butter, whether you're going through craft card stock or more substantial vintage book covers, for example, this one gets the job done. It, it can even go through fabric if you put another piece of paper underneath, which a hole punch like this is not able to do. And of course you have the added value of being able to set your eyelets with this tool as well. And depending on the size of your eyelet, you can change these settings here. You can just twist these by pulling them up and twisting them. I would say play around with these settings to see which one works best for the eyelets you have. And another great feature is that here and here it has scales, both in centimeters and inches, that you can adjust here which will enable you to punch your hole always on the same height. Depending on where you want it. Definitely a tool worth investing in. So here are some examples of how I use punched holes or eyelets in my journals for decoration. So here we have two holes with two distressed 
whole reinforcements and then I tied some fun fiber around them just for some more interest on your journal page. Obviously to attach tag toppers, punched a hole here, added a whole reinforcement and added this beautiful sari silk ribbon on top. For adding functional elements, for example, to attach this CD envelope here, or on top here to attach this piece of vellum, or on the side here to add a fun dangle. If I had to pick a favorite glue and my most essential glue, it would be this art glitter glue. And I also will link a video for you below with my most favorite glues for junk journaling and which glue I use for what and why with concrete examples. I talk about art glitter glue in many of my videos because for me, it's the perfect glue for so many different applications. I use the smallest available bottle, which is two ounces or 60 milliliters. And I use the metal tip, which comes separately. I usually have a dangle on top here, but I need to reattach that because that kind of came off. I like buying these 16 ounce or 480 milliliter refill bottles because it's a lot more economical than buying these and then just refill my small bottle. And for anyone who is new to art glitter glue, there is no glitter in this glue. I know that is a misconception. I kind of wish they would change the name because it's very misleading. But I love it because it's fast drying and it will not warp your paper. And of course, because of this metal tip, you can glue down really fine elements. For example, some very intricate die cuts are perfect for this metal tip. I have tried other smaller bottles with metal tips where I would just fill other kinds of glue into them. But for me, they always clogged up and they were very hard to squeeze. This one for me is perfect. I also use this to glue down whole pages. So for example, if I glue down a whole page like this, I'm just going to add my art glitter glue on the edge here, go around it once and that's it. You don't need to add glue on the middle of your page. It's a waste of glue and it's not necessary. One more fact I'd like to add is that this art glitter glue is not shipped during winter because it changes the consistency when it freezes and then it becomes very thin and doesn't work as well. Next are distress inks and or oxides. You see my collection here. I love using these for various techniques. But the most essential one is some kind of a dark brown color to distress my edges for a vintage look. My go-to used to be vintage photo distress oxide, but since a while now, I have moved on to a little darker shade with the walnut stain. And to go with it, of course, you need some sort of a tool to apply your distress oxide or ink. I use these very classical ones by Ranger and Tim Holtz. I will also link videos below for you where you can see how I organize and swatch my distress inks and oxides in case you're interested. So I ink around most images and ephemera and sometimes even pages. In my current junk journal planner, I do not ink the edges of my coffee dyed paper, but I do ink the edges of the digital, giving it a nice contrast. I ink up really most of my ephemera here. You can see it here as well. Also on this one. And I think it makes a huge difference in the overall look of your journal. So here again, this pocket, for example, or also the image here on the tag and the edge of the cardstock here. Another essential for me would be different fabrics or lace. Again, using this tag as an example, I used some denim here as a tag topper here on this belly band because I think it provides such a soft element to your journals and it just makes you want to touch your pages. On this one, I have some lace. 
Here again we have a fabric tab and some lace here as a base of the belly band. For this loaded pocket I used fabric here for the individual elements and again lace here as a page tab for the beginning of February. And again more lace on top here of this tag. I also love using fabric for my covers. Mostly I like to use designer fabrics. This one is by Tim Holtz. Fabric or denim is of course great for making pockets or individual elements. If you're using thinner fabric, like regular cotton fabric, you can also use your dies, even your thin dies, to cut out shapes. Here you see I used fabric as a whole page background as well. Here's the whole tag made with different fabric elements that are collaged as focal points. The back is cardstock. And of course, you can use fabric as closures by just cutting a strip, fraying the edges and using them to tie your crocodile together. <laughs> Here I used fabric as a base for my focal point and here as a journal spine. And my next essential supplies is fibers and thread, which adds a lot of character and another textile element to your journals. So we have some thread underneath this die cut here on my cover. We have it here to attach a fabric button and also here. I mostly like to attach fibers under little clusters. Here's another example, just bunched up white sewing thread. Here's some gold thread on this button. Coming back to fabric, it's also great to use as hinges because it's very soft. Not like paper, which first of all could break if you move it like this too often and it's a lot more stiff than fabric. When I fussy cut butterflies, for example, I'm usually too lazy to cut out the antennae, so I replace them with some thread. My next essential junk journal supplies is black stamping ink, in particular one that is permanent. My favorite two are these here, Archival Ink by Ranger and Stazon Ink by Tsukneko. So both of these are permanent. I also have re-inkers for these because when they fade, I don't need to buy a new ink pad. I just need to re-ink them. Some examples of using these in my journals. For example, here I stamped 1960 on this page. And we have this one here. Or the number here. Also these numbers here. I like stamping with permanent ink especially because then I don't have to worry if I decide to then later go over it with any kind of wet medium, whether that be distress inks or oxides or paints or matte medium or clear gesso, I don't have to worry about them smearing. There's another one here, more up here or underneath here. My favorite way of constructing journals or junk journal planners is with a grocery paper bag, which is what I used to make this planner because it makes them very squishable. I love the sound. The spine is very adjustable. So my next essential item is a paper bag. <laughs> These are just perfect for a base of a journal. You can get them in different sizes. This would make a really cute small journal. Like this, for example, add handles to your journal. You could clip this one off, for example, and attach it to this side, and then you would have a little journal, like a little purse. I've done that before, super fun. 
and you can just cover it with fabric or even just with paint. If you're interested in seeing how I make this style of journal, you can find a video for that linked below. Obviously, you're going to need something to sew in your signatures. Here, for example, we see four rows of stitching for four signatures. So we're going to need some kind of awl to poke our holes. I prefer using an awl like this to a different kind of poke tool like this because this is much better to hold. I can much more comfortably push this in because of this kind of a handle. I think you can get these really cheap. And of course, we're going to need a needle. I have this very cute needle booklet that my friend Honey made for me. I just made some alterations to it so that I would have some pockets to add some embroidery thread, which is, of course, the next essential tool. I always use embroidery thread to sew in my signatures. I have used wax thread as well, but I like how soft the embroidery thread is and I've never had an issue that it might break. So it's really fun to have a little needle booklet for on the go where you can have some of your favorite embroidery thread inside some pockets. Here's a little lace pocket. You could add some more decorations, of course. And in the middle here is a section with felt into which you can add your needles. I like to have a variety of needles. For signatures, I usually will take this one which has a nice pointy tip and an eye that's big enough to hold my embroidery thread. And I also find it super helpful to have one of these threading helpers. I'm not sure if there's a more technical term to that, which will help you pull your thread through the eye of the needle. That also works for the sewing machine, of course. I like using these acrylic tea boxes to store my thread for at home. So I made myself these thread spools out of designer cardstock. I actually hand cut these, but of course you can find dies if you have a die cutting machine to make these. I doubled these up because I wanted them to be nice and sturdy. And I also wanted the designer paper, which was only one sided to have a design on both sides. So I keep these in here more or less sorted by colors. And then in this one, I have the ones that I have not started to unravel or only used a small piece. I used to have these all just bunched up in a bag and I really didn't enjoy having to untangle them every time I wanted to use some. Another essential is of course a good pair of scissors. These are the ones I use most this is my most recent purchase. These are by Tim Holtz and Tonic Studios. What I love about these is, first of all, the size. They're great for cutting out larger pieces of ephemera. I love these soft handles. They are really comfortable to hold and they're very big, so your hand fits in very nicely. They cut really well. And I also like that they have this protective cover. Then I have this small pair which I use mostly for intricate fussy cutting because with this one you can easily maneuver around smaller detailed shapes. This is not something I could do with large scissors and of course a separate pair of scissors for fabric which is why I have a piece of fabric around them so that I don't forget that I only use these for fabric. I have learned from experience that you do not mix fabric and paper scissors because once you use your fabric scissors for paper, it will no longer cut fabric well. My next items are stencils or masks. I would consider myself a stencil junkie. <laughs> so this is my drawer of stencils. I'm not really sure how else to organize them because they all have different sizes. So, so far for me, this has been the best solution, although I don't really enjoy rummaging through these 
when I'm looking for a specific one. Let me share my current favorites with you. From PM Artist Studio, there's one called Aqueous Effervescence, and it's available both in a small and a large pattern. Turn this around so you can see. So this is the small pattern. And this is the same pattern in large. Both absolutely gorgeous. Then I have this grunge mask by Studio Light, which has the number SLGR Mask 16. Here you have a better view of it. This next one again is Studio Light. Here you have another view. And this one has the number SLGR Mask 13. And finally, I think this one is super fun by Ranger and Diane Reevely Dilutions. And this one is called Coins Large DYS78012. In my Defemember 2023 journal, I can show you examples of that large coin stamp. So here I made some houses. This was for the prompt Kintsugi houses. And you see here on the background, here and here and here, we have that stencil design. And also here on the back, you can see it here and here. It's just a really fun and versatile pattern. In general, I really love using stencils mostly to spray through with my distress sprays, like here, for example, or here with some mica sprays. It's just another way of adding some interest to your pages. This here is the negative of the stencil. Again here, very simple, but I just love it. Or on the background here, again using mica sprays or here using a stencil on the background and then a mask on top. And if you're wondering about the difference between a stencil and a mask, the mask is basically the inside part of a stencil. When you cut the inside out to form the stencil, the part that you cut out is called a mask. So for example, this here is this right here, and this is a mask. And this here I made by just taking this and once I've sprayed on it, I turned it around and pressed it against this page. This one again was a mask that I sprayed and then stamped. Even though I don't like this page here, these butterflies are masks. And here we see the effervescence stencil by PM Artist Studio used with mica stains. And this one here is a paper bag that I cut apart, which has a jelly plate print. And this is again, the effervescence design in the large version. So gorgeous. And my last essential tool is this heat tool by Ranger. Again, it doesn't have to be Ranger in my eyes. I'm sure there's other brands out there. This is the one I have and love. I used to have one of these heat tools which is especially great for embossing. But what I do not like about these kind of heat tools is that the airflow is so strong that I'm not able to dry, for example, splatters on my pages without the splatters blowing all over my page, which is the reason why I got this one, which has a much softer stream of air coming out and I can dry my splatters or other wet media very easily with this. And a great bonus is, and I didn't know this when I purchased this, is that it also works great for embossing. When I purchased this, I thought I would need both tools, but now I'm so happy that I only have this one and it's always on my desk, ready to go. So if you enjoyed this video, you might also really enjoy this one right here. Love you guys. Mwah, mwah.